to the first workshop, and I think we're discovering that these workshops are both incredibly popular and incredibly interesting, so I'm very glad to come to this one, but uh, very aware that there are lots and lots of uh, interesting discussions going on. My first thing is to apologise for not being Emily Drani, as you heard, that she, who is the vice chair of INTO, um, got stuck in Uganda and couldn't get here, so I've been on the chair, and... Um, I will do so, but I know Emily was incredibly keen to be here, so and she'll be sending us lots of love and good thoughts, I know. Um, what the function of this workshop is, is, is perhaps as close to the heart of what we've been discussing about as it's possible to be, because this is all about whose heritage counts, whose heritage even gets on the radar, how we look at heritage through the eyes of people who perhaps have not been part of the narrative and not been part of our stories, and indeed, you know, what are some of the things that we can do? And we're going to hear um, four very short presentations. Now, I know Emily asked you all to do five minutes, and she would, I'm sure, be um, helping me to keep you to five minutes, because if you keep to five minutes, we can have lots of discussion, and you can come back again and interject in the discussion. So let's keep the initial presentations very short, because what we're doing is starting off by just kind of raising the issues not trying to provide all the answers, um, because we hope the group will work together at some of the challenges and how we can deal with them. So I'm going to introduce our speakers first, um, and then we'll begin. So first is Alice Chaperoni from FI. Um, second is Ajala Omadeli, who is going to speak to us from the um, organization, the African Diaspora Heritage Trust. Um, on the whole issue around the memory of the African people. And he's accompanied by Ms. Maxine Esdali, who is a board member, I believe, of the Trust, and we're very, very good to see you here as well. Mm -hmm. um, David Scott from the Zimbabwe National Trust, and Queen Quet, who is no introduction after her wonderful address yesterday. So, um, without more ado, I'm going to ask Alice to, to kick off. And Alice is going to, she's the Properties Marketing Manager for FI, and she's going to talk about FI's work um, looking at the people who come to Italy from other countries, actually, and how a FI can help them engage not only, I think, with their own heritage, but with the heritage of uh, the FI itself. So, Alice, over to you. Hello, everyone. For me, it's the first time at this conference. So, thank you for uh, I just have a few slides, um, but I will be very quickly. Uh, just to show who we are, because maybe, I don't know how many of you know FI. FI is a private foundation that was born in uh, 1975. Uh, it takes care of special places, promotes education, and monitors on the protection of all Italy natural and cultural assets. Uh, we manage, uh, sorry, we we manage 61 properties and 30 of those are open to the public. We are more or less all over Italy, even if we are more concentrated in the north of Italy because Pai was born close to Milan, so in the north of Italy. Um, and I want to show you um, that we not, all, not, not also um, preserve castles, villas, or gardens, but we we want uh, uh, to preserve also very special places uh, that uh, particular heritage, like uh, the smaller theater in the world, like a uh, very nice uh, um, Liberty Journal kiosk, uh, or like uh, this uh, beautiful barber shop where you can go and cut your hair if you want uh, from 100 years. And, and then we are launching a very uh, challenging project about uh, preserve arts and uh, all the um, all the uh, different uh, arts uh, around Italy. But uh, the project I will show you today is uh, called Five Ponte Culture. In English, in English is like Five, that in Italian means uh, let's do. Uh, uh, bridges behind cultures. Uh, it's a really important project for us and we are working to develop it from uh, this, this year uh, because we want to use Italy's historic, artistic and cultural uh, assets to promote interest, inter integration and uh, uh, interaction between people from di of different origins and different cultures. 
because uh, we think that uh, our country heritage is valuable also for the um, because it reveals connection and uh, uh, link with ancient and more recent uh, um, part of the world. So um, uh, it involves native Italians because uh, thanks to the help of uh, foreign volunteers, uh, we can discover how our heritage has been influenced by other cultures. And it involves foreign born citizens because um, we um, we organized three art and historic courses for them in order to uh, allow them to explain our history and our heritage to their uh, to their uh, people that uh, talk the, the same language. And uh, so, what we what we will do? We will organize three courses of Italian history, and uh, we. Um, identify in our properties what are the elements that come from different cultures. And so, in last week, we had uh, uh, our most important national event that is called the uh, Five Spring Days, when uh, we open most, uh, more than 1,000 places that are usually closed around Italy. And we, last week, in, uh, involved more than 100. Uh, foreign volunteers that have explained it to other people in their own language the history of these places. And then in five of our properties, there were uh, foreign volunteers that were explaining uh, the links with, uh, be, uh, between our, these properties and also their um, original cultures. I will show you just some photos. These are uh, a particular of a uh, nabbey we have in Puglia, and where there was a Syrian professor that explaining all the uh, all these beautiful uh, um, uh, these beautiful uh, figures. And then we had in uh, in Sicily in the garden of the Polimetra a Greek professor explaining uh, this beautiful garden and these uh, aqueducts that uh, belongs to. The, ancient uh, um, Greece population. And uh, we have uh, a Chinese uh, girl that was explaining at the Chinese collection in our house museum in Milan. And uh, we also have a Mexican and a, um, um, and a people from uh, Guinea explaining the, the African and pre-Columbian collection we have in Villa Panza. So it's a project uh, that uh, Harlow's uh, our uh, Italian people to know better the other cultures and at the same time uh, we want to involve foreign people in Italian cultural and artistic uh, life. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get straight on and then we'll get into discussion, but thank you very much, Alice. You're such a fantastic example. Mm -hmm. So now, Jala Umadegui, who, as I said, um, is, is the keeper of the memory of the ancestors working here in Bermuda as a Bermudan, but working on the story, the often untold story of the Africans here in Bermuda. So, Jala, over to you. Um, don't start timing. <laughs> <laughs> because it is, it would be disrespectful to me to engage in conversation about my ancestors and their importance and their centrality here in Bermuda without inviting them into the space first. We don't sure. do that. That's like coming into a place and not wiping my feet. So I just ask that you give me that time to call the names of some keepers of memories who were born here on this land and who worked here on this land. Ira Phillip. Eileen. Nelly Musson. Ashe. Ashe. Sally Bassett. Ashe. Cyril Packwood. Ashe. Mark Allboy. Ashe. Mary Prince. Ashe. Ashe. I invite you into this space to hopefully give some wisdom to my words and to know that we have not forgotten you. Ashe. Ashe. Now, one of the issues that I often have when um, dealing with the story of Africans in Bermuda, or dealing with the story of Bermuda writ large, is that quite often, too often, the people who are telling the story are the hunters. There's an African proverb that simply says, 
only when lions have historians will hunters cease being heroes. Exactly. Unfortunately, exactly. the hunter's perspective often carries the day because of, you know, I only have five minutes, but the legacies of institutionalized white supremacy, um, which permeate the, the, the space we now know as Bermuda, right? the, the Isles of Devils, very happy name. Um, and one of, the, one of the myths that has been uh, promulgated is that somehow slavery was benign here. Mm -hmm. A speaker yesterday spoke on the idea of, I think he used the phrase, uh, folk were, because of the proximity, somehow the slavery experience was fundamentally changed here. Right? I've heard this, this familiar refrain trotted out by such scholars as um, Michael Jarvis, Virginia Bernhard, here in Bermuda, uh, James Smith. Others have grievously, m and others have grievously misrepresented the story of the violence. Right? William Zool is another one. Again and again and again, this idea of the benign nature of enslavement uh, is, is bandied about and unfortunately has been absorbed by many of us who haven't been dedicated um, destroyers of white lives masquerading as the story of this island. Mm -hmm. But our ancestors speak, you see. They, they, they tell glorious truths of whether white people like it or not. In my upcoming book entitled, um, a, what it called? Yeah. a Tale of Two Women, Sally Bassett, Mary Prince, and the True Story of Slavery and Bermuda. Mm. I took this excerpt, excerpt, and hopefully it won't take me three minutes to read. It's called Kill Them All. Mm. Wherever whites imposed chattel slavery upon Africans, fierce resistance was sure to be found. Bermuda, a, a tiny subtropical backwater more than 600 miles east of the Carolinas, was not exempt from this trend. Some local and foreign historians have claimed that the re re relationship between the enslaved black Bermudian and the white Bermudian enslaver was comparatively amicable. They argued that the presence, the absence of the plantation system combined with the fact that blacks and whites lived and worked closely together somehow fostered a refreshingly collegial atmosphere that magically dissolved any enmity between the owners and their shackled property. These historians repeatedly opined that relations between the races in Bermuda were so much better than in other less enlightened locales. If we take their statements to be true, it would logically follow that such a tranquil and harmonious social climate would likely not trigger the viral spread of righteous bloodlust among the enslaved. So why then would the island's blacks plan to embark upon a premeditated orgy of mass murder with the intention of slaying their white compatriots down to the last man, woman, and child? Put another way, how do we reconcile the image of the happy black slave and the kindly white master with the jarring reality of the conspiracy of 1761. In that year, more than half of the island's enslaved black population conspired to murder their way out of bondage by killing all of the white people. An action that would simultaneously abolish slavery, slavery in Bermuda and allow them to assume total control of the island. The scope of the conspiracy reflected a great deal of plan. Firstly, enslaved domestics would be enlisted to lace their owners' food and dwellings with poisons that would bring about their death. This initial strike would be followed by the systematic killing of owners and their children in their beds, along with the murder of those blacks who were judged to be on the side of the whites. By the end of, all, of the bloodshed, all of Bermuda's nearly 5,000 whites would be dead, and the 4,000 enslaved Africans would be free, the unquestioned masters of the realm. On the evening of October the 12th, however, a secret discussion related to the uprising was overheard by a white seaman named John Vickers, who alerted others of the grave threat to white life posed by the plotting of the conspirators. Vickers raised the alarm the following morning. Uh, Vickers raising of the alarm the following morning set in motion a series of events that the whites hoped would keep them out of harm's way. Martial law was declared, and many suspected conspirators were expelled from the island. Each parish was also required by law to, as to assign teams of watchmen to monitor free and enslaved Africans. Legislation was also passed to further constrain the movement of the island's blacks and to facilitate the expulsion of free blacks from Bermuda. Of particular note is that, whether enslaved or free, black Bermuda held its collective tongue. They refused to divulge any details of the conspiracy and its principal architects, in spite of repeated offers of manumission and financial reward. And it is because of their willingness to remain silent that although the number of conspirators was surely greater, only six people, five men and one woman, 
were eventually found guilty, lynched, and burned. Mm -hmm. Now again, at the outset, I spoke of that African proverb. Well, this is our ancestors leaving a, a, a very comprehensive record of the fact that slavery in Bermuda was anything but benign. So terrible was it, in fact. They were, they were willing to kill every last white man, woman, and child on this island. Mm -hmm. So in light of what they said, in light of the words of the lions, mm -hmm. we have to find the hunters' fictions wanting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was incredibly powerful. Now, uh, David. So, David, you um, have been involved with the Zimbabwe National Trust for many years. Are you going to talk about politics? I think yeah. you're yeah, um, yeah. at, at uh, Zimbabwe and colonial Africa. Okay. Um, so, I don't know how much uh, a lot of you know about the, the history of Zimbabwe, but I just need to paint uh, a little bit of a picture so that you understand where the heritage conservation situation stands or stood and now stands and, and where we're going to go in the future. And so I need to just give you a whistle-stop tour of what, what the history of, of Zimbabwe was all about. And it's basically all about suppression, to be perfectly honest, uh, for the last goodness knows how long. Um, it started with the Matabili coming up from South Africa, suppressing the Shona, who were already present in the country. In the belly, I'm sorry. In the belly? In the belly, yeah. Uh, an offshoot of the Zulus. Um, then the Europeans arrived, and of course they then suppressed everybody that was, was, was present in the country. That led to a liberation war, uh, at which in 1980, President Mugabe was installed as the, the first black leader of the country. And he led us until uh, 2017, so 37 years, during which time uh, it started off in a very positive vein, um, but essentially um, it was run as a one-party state. There was no opposition uh, tolerated uh, and, and in, in existence. Um, and when opposition came up, it was very, uh, very heavily suppressed, uh, along with uh, suppression of the minorities that, that uh, existed in the country at the time. And the general theme of how the country was run was basically on suspicion of, of, of the different races uh, and divide and rule. Um, and that, that seemed to be uh, President Mugabe's general uh, modus operandi. Um, we then went through a, a major land redistribution exercise, uh, which in hindsight ended up with land being distributed to army and, and political allies, as opposed to uh, distributing it to the people that were, were, were in desperate need of land. Um, and since then, obviously, land tenure has been a very insecure situation in Zimbabwe, and still is to, to this day. And during the course of that time, we had a, a pretty horrific economic meltdown. We, we got to something like a million percent inflation. Um, and our final Zimbabwe dollar currency, we had $100 trillion equal to one US dollar 50. So it, it, the country basically imploded. Um, in November 17, um, a, a coup that wasn't a coup took place, where, where the President Mugabe was essentially forced to resign. Um, and a new dispensation uh, commenced under uh, one of his previous deputies, uh, Monangagwa, E.D. Monangagwa. Um, and at this, at this point in time, there's an, an uneasy calm, and more, but more open dialogue between the private sector and, and government. There is a much more uh, open attitude to, towards discussion. So it was a um, four decades, almost, of of suppression and, and people uneasy and, and not willing to put their heads above, above the parapets. Um, and the only thing that, that really was given emphasis was anything that uh, was designed to keep the ruling party in, in power. And that included heritage. So they, they, there was very little one could do about, uh, about developing heritage, heritage conservation because the government felt that was its, uh, its remit and only its, its remit. Um, that, that, is, that is changing now with the, with the new dispensation. 
So the National Trust itself ended up in a 10, maybe 15 year lull of, 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 of not really being able to do too much and also in the face of this massive economic meltdown uh, where we de were described as um, one of the worst uh, environments outside of a war zone at, at one point in time. Um, the problem that we have with the, the National Trust is that it was an act passed in 1962, which was obviously well before uh, independence. There's a perception of a colonial past, uh, which, which, we're, which we're working on, on correcting now. Um, and the other big issue is that we're finding it extremely difficult to get uh, people to come on to our council. And as a result, we've got what I call a two white council. We're, we're seven out of 11 of the council members are, are actually uh, white people when, when in fact it should be very different to that. So we then said what do we do now and, and, and we've, we've started what we consider as an outlook program um, where our one, one property we have, we have seven properties, three of which are developed. Uh, one is a museum and we've used the museum to reach out into the local community in the area in which it operates. Uh, to the, the, local, the local community and the schools. Um, and we've asked them what is it that they would like to see in, in our museum. And we've started uh, uh, putting into the museum exhibits which, which meet the, uh, the aspirations of, of the local community and, and the local leaders. And they've come to us with ideas of what they would like to see in, in the museum. And it's an inclusive view. It's not... Um, I'm not suggesting that anything that had anything to do with colonial past and, and so on is, is, is binned. Um, it's, a, it's a completely in, uh, inclusive uh, picture that the museum is now starting to, to put together. And at the same time, um, we, we are focusing on the education aspect, uh, heritage and environmental education, uh, with the junior schools as, as our target. Uh, we have four properties which we need to develop, um, at which our vision is to have interpretive centres there for environmental and historic education of, of schools and the local, the local community. And they're quite, they're quite widespread properties, so there'll be, there'll be different aspects uh, of, of the history and culture uh, developed in, in different areas. As far as heritage that has not yet been identified, we, we believe there are an awful lot of um, areas of, of uh, religious and historic importance that are, are not protected. Um, the National Museums and Monuments Commission, which is the, the department within government that handles uh, uh, historic sites, has no money and no skills able to, to really expand the, the current portfolio. And so we've started, we started talking to one of the uh, very influential uh, elders in the ruling party um, who started to talk to local chiefs to identify um, uh, religious sites uh, and historic sites that we could then start to coordinate uh, perhaps a program of, of uh, educating people, protecting those areas. And the, since the new dispensation has come in, there's a, a new syllabus that's been introduced into the schools which indicates that government is committed to uh, to heritage education uh, and it's quite an extensive syllabus which we'll be working with uh, with them and um, so our intention is um, to to basically focus on the local communities and schools in the areas in, in which we operate and to try to open up and build a, a better relationship with government uh, to, to try and get to groups with the heritage that's not yet uh, protected. Oh, thank you. Thank you Goodness, and now Queen Quashi needs no introduction except having met her CV. Um, I'm a bit more um, amazed that she, she's such a polymath, but as we all know, she um, is the Queen of the Gogichi um, peoples, and you're going to talk to us, I think, about unheard voices. Mm -hmm. that right. Mm -hmm. Santa Hafi like a model child. Santa Hafi like a model 
and things like that. Them cracky people tell me, say, great God, that ain't how we post it. So, the true one that we tell a lot of our people, stop speaking our own mother tongue. Started speaking this way. Thinking they were now communicating with those who had come in, who were the Anglo people from Europe, that said the only language that was worthwhile speaking was theirs. It was the only language that could count. And in their language, they started to count the Africans as they loaded them aboard the vessels. They counted how much they would make and profit based on your skill set, your ability, based on the region from which they captured us. Then they put you in the auction block, and the bidder started to count on how much money, how high could he really get this to add up to before he hit the gavel and said, so. And now there are those of us who also count what money we could make and that maybe if we articulate things this way and don't speak about those ancestors who are inextricably tied together, who created this cultural community so rooted in the Americas that even those from Africa come to visit us on the Sea Islands because they have assimilated even in the motherland because others have come in there and said to them, you shouldn't speak the way that you speak. You shouldn't do those rituals because they're barbaric. That's not spirituality. That is paganism. Lose it! It doesn't <coughs> count. So, if they do it, they do it in places where our spirituals used to be sung in the bush hours, the brush hours, the places where they can hide it, where nobody is counting them except God. It's counting how many souls, how many spirits haven't been lost in this flood of assimilation globally into one massive story that somehow is literally whitewashed that says there's no color in it. And so therefore we go to the museums and we want to look at the artwork as long as there's nobody in it. Because the moment that we see a photograph or an image with somebody in it, you start to think, who is that? Because then, if you say, who is that? Then that's another person that has culture, intellect, heritage, spirituality, that has feelings and emotions. And then if we think back about who that person is, we have to think back to where they rooted and what grew from those roots, and where did that tree grow? 
So now we have to start counting up the stories that could be told if we sat underneath that tree with that one there, and yet it wouldn't crack it, they didn't say. So if we sat under one of those lovely trees on a less breezy day than this mm -hmm. one, <laughs> we might actually just tune our spirits in and hear those voices coming from beneath the soil, the very souls that were there, that shouted, that sang, that cried, whose blood sweated, <coughs> tears counted in the building of everything around the world. Those African children, Mother Africa birthed many that got scattered to the four winds. Some violently taken aboard and brought to places. Some went aboard and their ships landed somewhere they didn't expect to be. And here their journey continues because as long as you call a man or woman's name, that man or woman's spirit continues to live. But do we know their names and do they count? So when you see the Gullah Geechee national flag, you see that our family tree is in the center and it is those African bodies who are inextricably tied together. These are those souls that all have come to be known as Gullah Geechee. Gullah, the word itself, means people blessed by God. But for so long, people said our language, our traditions, our culture didn't count except on an auction block. And here it is, there hasn't been a place that I've gone to yet in the world that someone doesn't tell me of the journey and the story of my own people landing in that land whether it is Canada, whether it is England, whether it is here in Bermuda, someone says, you're from where? The Gullah Geechee Nation, the Sea Islands. Wait a minute. Some people came from Carolina and ended up here. They fought, they bled, they built, they communed, they have families rooted here now. But we don't call them Gullah Geechee. We call them Enterprise. We call them American. We call them Seminole. We call them Black Seminole. We call them Muscogo. But all of them crack your teeth like a dish, and when I crack mine like a dish, but a yeti one that sound like this. It counts, and they come running, and they say, How do you know how to do that, <laughs> sister? I say, Because I'm the Gullah Geechee, who And they said, Oh my God, you sound like my grandma. <laughs> you remind me of the generation of my family that used to speak that way. I said, why don't you? Because in school, they told us not to. The place that we're telling people to go to learn, to be the future preservationists, the future historians, the future curators, is the very place that's telling them when they get in there, you don't count unless we can sell your story. So for heritage tourism, come on over. <laughs> because we've calculated how many people now want to travel to where you're from and how we could sell that story. So maybe we can remove some of these and get some of those images with you in it. But then we got to raise the money. And it counts too. So as a mathematician, I thought of numbers when they gave me the title to this session. But I'm also a person that used to like to watch television. I thought of Bella Lugosi and vampires as well. Those were counts too. And I thought of how people could suck your very life away from you and then later sell it back in the form of a book that they wrote. So I started writing my own so that someone else wouldn't try to tell my story and tell another child that looked like me in the future that your story doesn't count. So now instead of hearing that, they often ask me, how many books have you written? And I let them know, even though I'm a mathematician, I never counted it. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I'm still writing, still speaking, and still journeying together. And I hope we'll continue this cultural heritage journey together, because I believe that all our stories do count. Incredibly moving uh, as we were yesterday.
but I think we've had, you know, two stories of two national trusts working to try to kind of reimagine relationships, to cast aside traditions and to traditions which were unashamedly and absolutely based on certain conceptions and working to try to reach new audiences and understand new stories, new narratives, new relationships. We've also had two of the most moving presentations I've heard in a long time from people whose voices have not been heard, people whose voices have been interpreted in ways that don't feel authentic and real and there's a challenge there, particularly I think the challenge that um, Ajali gave us. So we, we're dealing with really profoundly important issues, ones that can't be reduced to simple solutions, but equally, perhaps, perhaps the first step is simply acknowledging um, the depth and the philosophical kind of nature of this, of this whole debate. So there's lots more I think I certainly would like to hear from our speakers, but actually I just want to know from some of the people in the room whether these discussions have what they mean to, to, to people from national trust from other countries first. So who'd like to just remind remember to say who you are. Who'd like to who'd like to just you know, is it does this resonate? Does this challenge? Does this yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you looked at me. You spoke for him. Do I have to stand up or is it going to be hard to see? Just tell um, us who Yeah, are. I'm Walter Hallebrand and um, from St. Eustatius, that's mm -hmm. uh, one of the Dutch Caribbean islands. And um, uh, I'm Monuments Director, so my job is to look after Bill's heritage, but I'm also Secretary of the Historical Foundation that runs the museum. And I was curator of the slavery exhibition in the museum. Um, which um, um, can be uncomfortable because I'm very white. Mm. So, um, but nevertheless, um, and just like you said about Bermuda, how they're trying to say that slavery on Bermuda was very different. There are lots of similarities between Bermuda and Stasia. Stasia was also, St. Eustatius, we call it Stasia. Mm. It's a very small island, so St. Eustatius is far too long a name. <laughs> and, um, also, depending on trade, so exactly the same things that you mentioned about what historians say about the Bermuda, they say the same thing about Stasia because it was a trading island, not a plantation island, so it was benign. Mm. My reply is always, yes, look at, there's archival um, evidence of runaway slaves. If it was so benign, they wouldn't run away. Um, there was, uh, there in oral traditions, there are lots of stories, because um, especially when, when it's the uh, history of the, uh, of the hidden people or mm -hmm. the untold stories, you have to rely not only on archival evidence, but you also have to interpret oral history, which is tricky, but uh, we have a strong oral history tradition on St. Eustatius. And there they talk, there, they talk about how cruel some of the uh, slave masters were. And then there was a slave revolt on Stasia, and the, 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 I find it a terrible thing, the, oh, by the way, I am a station. I'm born and raised station. I always have to explain that. Mm -hmm. um, the terrible thing is that um, that slave revolt, which was is a very powerful event, and it, it's an event that I find that the children of the station need to know about because it, it it makes that they can feel proud of their ancestors. Twelve slaves were killed. We're a small island, so twelve on the slave population is long. And if you tell that story, the, 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 the descendants of those enslaved Africans on station can feel proud of their ancestors who did the Biggest thing you can do, they gave their lives for freedom, and not mm -hmm. in vain, because it was the slave revolt of Stasia, 1848, that was the signal to the Dutch government to be serious with abolition. Mm -hmm. That story is not told on Stasia. Mm -hmm. It's not in, in the school curriculum, nothing. Mm -hmm. So one of my missions is to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because also we know the names of those leaders of the slaves. So. Um, that's one of my campaigns to the point that our government on Stasia is black and our, most of our civil servants are black. Mm -hmm. Emancipation Day is celebrated on Stasia. It's, it's I think, the only one of the six Dutch Caribbean islands where Emancipation Day is big. Mm -hmm. It's for 1st of July. And um, so there was, a, there was a celebration and they asked me to give the keynote address. Mm -hmm. I said, come again? We can't get them whiter than this, and I have to deliver the keynote address for this event. Wow. Yes, because we know you don't have an agenda. We, we know that mm. you'll tell the truth as far as we know it, as far as we can interpret it and everything. So I did it, and um, the funny thing is that um, a, a, the person who spoke before me, a black station, said uh, the history is whitewashed. 
-hmm. and uh, children need black role models like Martin Luther King, or, or so the, in school we have to talk about Obama and uh, Malcolm X and everything. And then in the audience, there were people who were starting to shout, but, um, why are you looking for role models off-island? We need our own role models. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing was that, what was my keynote today is going to be about? About that slave right. revolt. Right. And we know the names of those leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me that was a special moment because I came up with the idea to talk about that slave revolt because also I want to change the national holiday of state to the date of that slave revolt. Oh. I, mm. I mean, I want to do that. It's my suggestion. <laughs> and now the government has picked up on it. Um, however, and now I'm coming to my point, um, um, there are people on Stacia, black people, who are telling me, and people who are, who are trying to communicate the same message, can you just stop talking about those days of slavery? I'm not a slave, my father was not a slave, Get, you know, move on, move on, it's too long ago. So how do I deal with that? Ah, great, great question. I'm going to ask Ajali to, to comment because actually this is very close to the experience that you just said that I want to come to. Keep in mind that the, <coughs> the institution of, of enslavement was mm -hmm. not just physical, it was also right. psychological. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a psychological bombardment, mm -hmm. terroristic mm -hmm. bombardment that went yes. on for centuries. Right. So what you see here in 2019 are the, in the minds of, of uh, today's African population, it's in the same group stations, um, people who are the fruit from that, that lineage. So it makes total and complete sense to me that folk who have been so beset by the, 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 the monstrous machinations of, of white supremacy in all of its manifestations mm -hmm. would want to reject mm -hmm. anything to do with such a, 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 a horrific time in their history. Because during, during their lifetimes, they would have been miseducated relentlessly mm -hmm. about what their people actually did. Mm -hmm. So why would I want to be aligned with anything to do with th that detested people? Exactly. I'm not that. I'm, not I'm something that. else. Right. So of course they would push back. That right. completely makes sense. Right. Now, <clears throat> what can be done about that? Well, you're white. I think okay. that's pretty clear. Um, this is where you can earn your allyship, if you will, and because they will listen to you. Other white people will listen to you. Like if I was saying what I said here, um, the ears in this room, the white ears in this room might be even wider to what I had to say. I know that. Not a big deal. I don't really care. But you have the moral obligation in order to get back your humanity. Because if you don't push back against white supremacy, you remain as human trash, you know, to take a line from Jamaica Kincaid's a small place. Yeah? Your human beingness is contingent upon your willingness to fight back against this, the, 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 the system, the global system that made you white, mm -hmm. that made you a monster. Mm -hmm. All right? So your role in that is to get back your humanity by any means necessary. I can't tell you how to do that. But I do know that part of that task, at least, is in the correct rendering of the story of African people. Right? Because that enslavement also marks a fundamental fracture in white humanity. Mm -hmm. Something happened to your people. Mm -hmm. Something terrible happened to you. Mm -hmm. And you've built your culture atop that fracture, that fissure line, that San Andreas fault. Right. Right? So that's something that you all have to address. I can't do that for you. Right. Okay, uh, before you come in, quick, I just want to bring, see if we've got another comment from another... Oh, I just wanted to answer his question for him. Okay, very briefly, yeah. but I just... We need, yeah. we need, we need yeah, to... Yeah, I understand. Yeah, but he has a question, so I don't yeah. like to leave people without an answer, a solution. He's dealing with a problem. I'm trying to give him a solution. You already addressed the fact that your government is not open to your concept of changing that national holiday. So that means you're a voice they're listening to. So the curriculum issue that you mentioned, you also already have listening ears. That the other folks who are saying to you, let's leave it alone, they don't have those same opportunities you would have. So once you go into the powers that be and help to change that narrative, those same people are going to change because it's going to become acceptable within your society to them that it's okay to talk about the history of enslavement and talk about the history of freedom and rebellion. So now they will start to de-assimilate 
and then go along with what the status quo is. So if the status quo becomes that curriculum change, that holiday change, those people are going to come along. So just work from where you are. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Kim Desmond Robinson. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I work for the Department of Culture here in Bermuda. And um, one of the, when, when we're talking about whose heritage matters and why, um, I do agree that it's really important for um, the, lion, uh, the, the lions to tell their stories. Um, when we're talking, of, and, and one of the, um, I think a fundamental issue here in Bermuda with regards to slavery is precisely this issue of it being um, uh, downplayed, the severity of it. Um, I think if they're here on this island, and I'm sure this may be the case for other places where there has been some level of, um, where, there's, where there's been distinct fractures, um, it's, it's fundamental to start from the place of saying there need to be some rules of engagement, mm -hmm. right? Some baseline rules of engagement. And I think for Bermuda, the baseline rule of engagement on this topic would be why would you feel the need in any way to sort of put slavery on a scale and say this is better slavery? This is worse slavery. Because if you understand anything about the nature of slavery, there is no better or worse. I think that's the baseline level of engagement. So moving from that point, if there is not an appreciation or an understanding of the stories that black Bermudians want to tell, I think the question that may need to be asked by white Bermudians or people who do not share that uh, experience in the way that we do is to say, why is this story actually important to you? This story that you want to tell and you, the fact that you want to tell it in this way, which is different perhaps from the way that I might tell it, why do you want to tell it in this way? What is the significance behind the story? Mm -hmm. And I think that is actually a really important starting place because when you when you ask those kinds of questions, and that is where the meaning making comes in. Because at the end of the day, we can, I'm not a historian, my field's literature, and part of the reason I like literature is because it allows some flexibility that history doesn't always. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <clears throat> looking at history, that is, the role of historians is essentially to interpret certain facts through a lens. So there is always an element, of course, of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you are wanting to interpret things in this way, and why does it matter to you? And that is the point, I think, where we can start to actually have honest and real dialogue. So. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just to follow on from Kim, I'm Charlotte. I'm also from Bermuda. And um, just to say these matters do concern me very much, too. But what I want to avoid is sort of talking about myself, because it is the issues, you know. And I think um, what all of you are uh, you know, saying so well, I think, is this, this creating space and stepping away, you know, especially those of us um, from a position of white privilege. Um, it, I guess I want to ask how far it needs to go as well in terms of um, maybe, you know, allowing more others to curate, allowing co-curation, but also really giving the power over curation, not just the stories to be told, but how they are told. So this links to your participatory, you know, real support, and, and I'm very much behind those sort of approaches. You're bringing in multiple interpretations, but so important in this particular realm in Bermuda. And I think, you know, we're all trying to, to learn and embrace, but we so easily retreat, I think, to what we know and our misperceptions and miseducation. And I think, um, I think, I think a lot about well, how can we create those platforms, you know? But it really is relinquishing some of that curatorial control, and I think it's kind of the difference between not being racist and being an anti-racist, you know? Um, how can we? There's maybe oh, okay, we include some more voices and we we have some good programming and things, but there could be a deeper shift, I think, and I know that's going on with some museums and heritage organizations. Um, but it is a push really to you know, feel like we could have that quantum leap mm -hmm. in a place here where we maybe haven't gone far enough yet um, and because the, the, because the fractures are so pronounced here. Um, but I find it's a, you know, it, it really is, it's like you want to find those, but you also need to let go. 
and letting go is the hardest thing. So, <coughs> yeah. Gus, I want to ask you to say something about how far can it go, how far should it go in the Smithsonian Museum? We know you, you, you could, it could go all the way. What is, what it, where is it going to land? But we have a, do you want to speak? Can I bring in the speaker? Yes. I guess the, the, the word that jumped at me when you were speaking was allow. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. See, that comes from a Bad position length. of power mm -hmm. already. Yeah, yeah. National trust, my perception of national trust, and I'm not the youngest person in the room, I'm not the oldest. Maybe I am the oldest. <laughs> anyway, from my perspective, national trust have always been other people's trusting my stuff. For example, the National Trust in Bermuda only recently had persons of African descent be a part of it in a real way. When the National Trust in Bermuda started, my perception was that was those white people talking about their stuff, mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. their stuff. If you look around this room, if you look around this building, mm -hmm. it's about white people's stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay? We have a little, we have a, a slavery exhibit down there. But although we've been here since the beginning, we have a yeah. exhibit down there. And if I might, Zimbabwe, which is a black African country, has a national trust. And you said there were seven of the 11 there. Like, who started the national trust in Zimbabwe? And how come Zimbabweans weren't on it from the very beginning? Because your trust in their country, that's theirs. That's not yours. That's theirs. So the opportunity as national trust organizations to go back and examine yourselves, because whose trust do you have? Not mine. Mm -hmm. When the National Trust was here, you don't have my trust because you don't talk about me in any real way. You don't recognize, you have to allow me. Like, allow me? I live here, born here. Zimbabwe was Zimbabwe long before we had any outside influence, but you're going to allow that there be um, Zimbabwean references there, whether it's their language, their culture, their food, or whatever. This allowing of people who are in the country in which you are a national trust mm -hmm. is what has been a burr in my side. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I look at national trust all over the world, mm -hmm. it's probably a concept that was integral in another way in another culture. They didn't call it national trust. They called it taking care of themselves or whatever. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> national trusts are a trust started by other people who are not of the country of which there is a national trust. And can I just say that there are some um, Bermudians who are from Eustatius, in fact, from my family also, who are Eustatius, or however you say that word. But that's what, that's what I think national trust organizations have to go back and think, and I really become aware of what do they say when they have representations in this room mm. that look like this. I think that that's a really fair challenge. I think Charlotte... And I just want to say, I, I totally see how much words matter. I yeah, took that from yeah. you yesterday, so, and I, I deeply apologize for that, because you're right. No, but this, the language matters so much. It matters mm -hmm. so much. It does, but I also think that's what, in many ways, this conference is all about. It's yeah. about the National Trust, um, who have their... Our history is our history, you know, um, but this is about us asking really big questions of ourselves. and. So, you know, it's a completely fair challenge, and I think that's why we're actually here. And there, it, it's not always easy, um, but I think we are in, a, in a, a moment in history where the world has different expectations of us, people have different expectations of us, and we're being um, invited, as it were, by ourselves to, to challenge more deeply than I think we have in the past. So, I am, I mean, anyone desperate to say something? I did want to ask us just a little bit about what you go through as a you know, curator of a museum of African heritage. What are the processes that you go through? Because clearly, what, a lot of what's been talked about is very pertinent to the role of curation. Mm. It, it, it is, and it, it is a, a challenge to the actual the paradigm of the Enlightenment Museum. I mean, the idea of the Enlightenment Museum is kind of, it's a citadel on, the, on a hill in which you protect objects and you protect <clears throat> a narrative and that you invite special guests in to, to be a part of that. And what the 21st century offers us is, particularly, I think, the digital space, is rather than it being one to many of these kinds of these kinds of spaces becoming many to many of us actually accepting that there are 
there are multiple ways in which we can actually engage, but there are also kind of multiple narratives that can be engaged with. And I, I find that very exciting and attractive. And for a, a museum director, it is about letting go. It is about relinquishing. But it's also, it also is emancipatory because it means that you can engage with so many different possibilities in terms of, 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 of narrative, which is, it is releasing. But it's about actually accepting that um, it's not a loss of power. It's actually a gaining of, 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 of options and partners and ways of thinking. Thank you. Now, who else hasn't spoken? Who would like to speak before I would happily listen? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say a few words about the Smithsonian of um, the U.S. National Museum. Um, I had the privilege. Sorry, this is my Arlene name. Fleming I'm from Washington D.C. I had the privilege of, of being part of the planning staff for an exhibit for the um, the Museum of American History. Um, on, um, on the history of the United States. And we had one case in the first hall um, on the Afro Africans and, in the United States. And it, it, we had a, a, a notice for one runaway slave and some manacles, and that was considered appropriate. No, no further mention. Uh, for the American Indians, we had some wampum and a feathered headdress, also considered appropriate. Um, now we have an entire museum for each of those groups. And as I understand it, those museums were created, planned, and created by the groups themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's an enormous um, accomplishment um, in, in a relatively short period of time. But then I think about the, um, the relationships between the races and the different parts of our population, and it's very uneven. I mean, we've made great strides in presenting the heritage in a national museum, but, um, and we have also an African uh, museum of African art too, which is something that was, believe me, never imagined. I mean, it was completely beyond our imagination. But, but when you say the we, it was Those imagined. of us who were working at the Smithsonian, it was absolutely beyond our imagination that there would be a museum dedicated entirely to um, African American history and one entirely to um, Native Americans. And I must say, for the African American Museum, as you probably have heard, it was impossible to get in there for months. It was so popular. I mean, you could not get a ticket. Um, for months, and um, so so, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we've made great strides in presenting the heritage, but the society as a whole is still the pattern of accommodation is still very uneven. Yeah, but that's where I think the Octavia Hill ambition of perpetual revolution of of always thinking that mm. there is more to do yeah. Yeah. and you know that we talk mm -hmm. it is amazing the strides we've made yeah. within the Smithsonian mm. but we have such a long way to go yeah. still mm -hmm. and I think it's important for us to acknowledge that I just need I have to say something here. Yeah. because you've mentioned a short period of time when I was told about the fight for the, what has become the National Museum of African American History and Culture of the Smithsonian. It had already been 216 years <laughs> that we had been fighting to get that museum. Mm -hmm. Then it was a fight on top of that because when they did the Anacostia Museum, they said, well, that's yours. We said, no, it's not, because we need one on the mall with yeah. the rest of them. Exactly. So then the fight continued until we have what's there now. Being a native Gullah Geechee, there are numerous items that were taken from the Sea Islands that are in that museum. I was just there to look and see what Lonnie and those did with them. Never once is the word Gullah Geechee in that museum. No. Everything is just black, Negro, African American, so that it blends so that it fits the header for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American. Louis Gates does the same thing. He came to where we are. He talks about African Americans being enslaved. African Americans weren't enslaved. That terminology was started in the 80s by Jesse Jackson. 
okay? But it was an avoidance of using the terms Gullah Geechee and giving specific credit to the ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And so the, the work that's done for us is still very offensive, mm -hmm. and it shows that those who've been assimilated and are the curators on the interior of a national institution still want to avoid really dealing with those who were the resi resistors. Because if you say Gullah Geechee, now they're going to find there's another narrative besides shackles. Okay? I've spoken at various Smithsonian's and got standing ovations every time I did. But now people beg and say, when are you coming back up here? I said, they don't want to bring me because when I get here, I tell too much of the truth. <laughs> and now it challenges what's on the walls. Mm -hmm. So I don't get invited. They'd rather invite, like you said, special guests who tend to be in a little club of guests mm -hmm. that support the narrative on the walls. So until we're going to break those walls down, this same discussion is going to go on another 216 years from now, you see? And then I just would challenge the trust, period, to build trust that not these same old breakout sessions, controlled, you get to talk when we call on you thing, it's not everybody's culture. That's not everybody's culture, and that's not the way we communicate where I'm from. And it's offensive to us when you try to box it in. You let the spirit flow and let the energy guide the discussion, and Same. then you can feel everyone, and everyone feels like they're contributing to the table that we're sitting at together. So I love that this was an oval-shaped table when I walked in here, but then the mechanism of operation in the room is still very linear and very Western. And that herein lies the problem. In these numerous discussions and interpretations, it still comes from the Western world. And it's not very African. It's not circular. It's not very indigenous. It's not circular. And to me, it feels more like I'd have rather been walking around outside still, because okay. it's amounting to what I'm used to in these things. Now, all challenges that are so relevant and so important. Um, Charlie, I think we're going to. And I was just going to uh, basically piggyback on the ride on, on the Queen's comments. Um, you talked about great strides. I don't see it like that. I see like uh, how Michael Jackson would moonwalk across the floor. Right? <laughs> the illusion of forward progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, as mm -hmm. Queen Fett said, it's very much not so in the eyes of the resistance. Um, I think white people have to do a whole lot of heavy lifting to get their humanity back. And we, as African people, I'm talking to the black folk in the room, don't need to be in the room when they do that. We have work that we have to be doing ourselves, first and foremost. Right? Um, people like Walter Rodney, when he went to the, uh, into the hills to talk with the Rastas, we grounded, right? we reasoned, we thought things out, because we had to understand and grab and take in how do we survive and thrive in the midst of white non-humanity. Right? You all have work to do to get your humanity back. Some of the things that you said I found fun, incredibly offensive, not to mention inaccurate, but that's your own stuff. You have to work on that, if you so choose. But as African people, we have work to do to get ourselves out of this white, global white mess that white people have created, trading their humanity for something, for a mess of pottage. Yeah? But again, as African people, we have the work to do to reclaim our own story, to protect our own story, because we are part of the story. We are the living heritage of which we speak. We are that flesh. We are that soil. And that is the work that we as African people have to do. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Now, listen, time's up. Um, yeah. For all of the challenges in the room, um, I think they're felt very deeply, and I think this is the beginning of a very long conversation and a very long conversation. Yes, very long. Thank you so much, everybody.